I'll be right back. Truly. Less than a minute. I will, like, never get tired of the secret Kai family noises. I'm just going to say it. He never shares. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. Never miss an episode. Hit that subscribe button. We will hook you up. Yeah, so there's going to be a dog and a 13-year-old and probably other kids. This podcast was and there should be. There should be. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Molly Wood. <laughs> and I'm Kai Rizdal with, with children and dog in tow. It is the Tuesday edition of Make Me Smart. It's our deep dive episode. One big, long topic with an expert to tell us exactly what's going on out there. Always, of course, followed by your comments and then the Make Me Smart question. Today, uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, we are all thinking in some way, shape, or form, and some states and cities are actually doing in some way, shape, or form um, this whole getting back to work thing. Um, so what is that going to look like when you go back to the office, whatever that, uh, office happens to be, what might you expect? And, and we're going to talk about that for a little while. Mm -hmm. What we're really going to talk about is that you can expect them to be watching you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just blew well, listen, my nose we right there. know <laughs> they'll be, they'll be looking, um, no, there's a whole bunch of new tech that is being marketed toward workplaces right now, because one of the primary differences between a place like America and a place like Singapore, where there's a lot of trust in government and the ability for government to say, hey, everybody download this app. We don't have that so much, um, but companies in many ways are going to be in charge of putting in mm -hmm. place the, the kind of surveillance that they hope will keep workplaces safe, keep uh, employees comfortable about the idea of coming to work. And so there's a whole bunch of companies saying, great, we would love to sell you uh, remote temperature monitoring cameras, yeah. contact tracing yeah. apps. Uh, PwC actually released a product that includes some contact tracing and employee wellness stuff. And oh, wow. so we thought that, oh yeah. Um, so we thought this might be a good time to have a conversation about this surveillance and what kinds of privacy issues may occur. Okay. Well, and, may. And my guess is they will be big privacy issues that may occur. Chris Calabresi is on the line. He's the vice president for policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Chris, thanks for coming on the pod. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, all right. So look, just like laundry list for me, as we go back into the office that first day, uh, what things should most of us be prepared to be encountering? Well, I, I mean, I think the thing about every American workplace is it's different. So you, no, no one will probably encounter all of these things, but you're, there's a lot of technologies that are floating around. One most obvious one is a way to take your temperature. So some kind of fever monitoring. Uh, mm -hmm. Another is a thermal camera that purports to take your temperature, but does a bad job. And we can talk about why that's the case. Uh, health quizzes. Why, you know, you know, did you have symptoms? Where have you been? Um, contact tracing. So, you know, who are you in proximity to? And, uh, and lots and lots of sensors, you know, Bluetooth or RFID, which is the, the technology that's used to take tolls to kind of see who's mm. close to each other, who's too close to each other. Um, and then lots of backend databases to track this stuff, you know, lots of information about you, information about your health, artificial intelligence to be used to decide how many people is too many people on the floor. Um, and then, of course, layered on top of all of the existing surveillance that many American workers face all the time, like, you know, having their movements tracked all the time if they're a UPS yeah. worker. So we're going to have a lot of different things and we'll probably see a whole menu from different employers. Do you think this is I mean, will this end up primarily being the job of employers, though, to put this these kinds of tech solutions, for lack of a better word? into place for either liability reasons or just actual risk mitigation? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be, obviously. And, you know, and we can talk a little bit about contract tracing because one of the interesting decisions that Google and Apple have made as part of their building the back end of some of these contact tracing apps is they've very purposefully wanted to work through government. So they're, you actually, if you're an employer and you go to Google and Apple, Right now, they won't let you use their backend services that integrate iPhones and Android phones to do a contact tracing app. They only, Google and Apple only want to do that through public health authorities. So I, I think it's going to be a mix, but certainly you're going to see a lot of employers, both for their own liability, but also because they know that em employees are worried about these things, um, trying a lot of different things. 
many of which are totally untested and likely to not work. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I wonder, Chris, if, um, so you mentioned the whole, you know, companies are doing it to protect themselves, but also because they know employees need that, that comfort level thing. Um, but companies seem to have all the choice here, right? I mean, companies are gonna institute these policies and workers are like, have choice, have no choice, they don't, right? If you wanna to go to work here, you gotta deal with these, with these measures, yes? Yeah, yes. I mean, unfortunately, employee, employees have relatively few choices. I mean, there are some rules. If you're taking health-related information like temperature, that can be saved, but it's gotta be saved separately from your employee file and, uh, and then, and there are some states, Texas, Virginia, Minnesota, where there's some rules about tracking people's location and movements. And those, you know, some of those rules may apply to some of these technologies, but by and large, there's relatively few laws. There's certainly no federal law, but there is also a, a little bit of a balance. I don't want to overstate it because there are state mm -hmm. constitutions that sometimes apply. And there's just also a you know, if you push this too far, you will see state lawmakers respond and say, this is crazy. People's privacy is at risk. And for example, in 29 states bar and the District of Columbia bar employers from monitoring and taking action against people based on what they do outside of the workplace. So when you see employers overstepping, you do see, you know, state governments sometimes take a role yeah. in trying to regulate that. Is there an opportunity now i know we're not great at this but is there an opportunity now for some states to get ahead of what is likely to occur because the, i mean look the gold rush is on now for yeah. these products and and what may end up being a lot of very invasive like you said health theater yes and that's and that's a great term for it I mean, and and part of that makes it hard to know quite what we're going to see right so I would call this just the way we saw after 9-11, um, your security theater, where it was sort of measures passed to make people feel better rather than really improve security. There's a real danger we're gonna see sort of public health theater. It's like, well, this will make you feel mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think we'll certainly could see states pushing back on stuff that's proven not to work. Like for example, even a thermal imaging camera company will tell you, or at least one that I found said, please do not use this for COVID-19 diagnosis. All we mm. can really do is tell you whether someone is a little warmer than average. That doesn't, that's not a COVID-19 diagnosis. So if you mm. see employers start to roll out these technologies that don't work, I think you are likely to see a backlash. When it comes to you know, measures that may actually mitigate the, the virus, then it's less clear. I mean, if they do have a public health benefit, I think it's gonna be a little more difficult to figure out how to regulate them properly. One thing, of course, Chris, for uh, bigger companies uh, to be able to do this kind of thing, because it requires some kind of investment on their part. Another mm -hmm. thing entirely for, for smaller businesses and startups, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you're going to see smaller businesses and startups look for a sort of off the shelf solutions, right? Yeah. And, you know, they're going to, and, and a lot of that stuff, I, I suspect, is either going to be sort of cheap things that are aimed at, at, uh, making people feel better, but don't do a whole lot of good, like the thermal cameras. Or you could see employers trying to just figure out ways to work with their employees, like a technology I think we'll see a lot is things like health quizzes, right? Where you're trying to talk to your employees, get a sense and help them get a sense about how they may have contracted an illness or things that they may want to think about and then you know, and then that'll be used as a sort of an, as part of an assessment. And that's where I think things gets tricky, right? If that assessment mm -hmm. is, seems fair and reasonable, employees are, are going to want to go along. They want their health protected. If it seems invasive, if it seems like something that in fact is just being used as an excuse to sort of ding their performance in some way, that's when yeah. I think you're going to see some tension between employees and employers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much of this is companies feeling like I mean, some of it is the opportunity to sell products, but how much of it is it's companies in some ways feeling like, well, listen, we have to fill a gap here, right? We don't have robust testing, tracing, and isolation yeah. in this country. And so companies are like, if we want to get back to work, we have to do something. Yes, I think that's part of it. There's also sort of a broader phenomenon here that we see across public policy when it comes to technology. 
And that's policymakers, employers tend to look at technology as sort of like magic fairy dust. They think they can kind of sprinkle it on any problem and use it to make it better. You know, it's cheaper, <laughs> yep. it's easier, right? right. And, and so you see a little bit of that here. We'll, we'll just throw some technology at it. And I think the reality is that we don't have a lot of proven technological innovations and the ones that we do have are in very early stages. I mean, contact tracing and exposure notification, which is to say, using your cell phone to know when you're in proximity to somebody else. And so if you do contact the disease down the line, you may be able to notify that person that, that, you know, that they may be, have been exposed. There's some promise there, but there's also a lot of kinks to work out. So I think we're really at that stage with a lot of these technologies. And so the reality is that it's probably not going to be a technology solution to a lot of these problems. It's going to be old fashioned testing and contact tracing and, but you know, obviously employers don't want to hear that. Governments don't want to hear that because those are expensive solutions and difficult solutions. They'd rather just kind of deploy a technology and be done. Right, right. And fundamentally, to quote all kinds of people about this, we got to figure out what the virus is doing and then we can figure out the rest of it, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. exactly um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so long term then, uh, what's, your, what's your concern level about... Um, privacy and as molly said the gold rush that really companies are going to be um really hard pressed to avoid partaking in uh, i mean it's very high uh i mean the reality is the long-term trends are really all towards more surveillance and not all not all data collection is bad but we are surrounded by data collection technologies right now your smartphone is the most obvious example it's tracking your yeah. location and who you talk to but I mean, we're recording this over a Zoom as lots of people are working remotely. Now, suddenly we've got videos of our workplace performance being recorded and all of our IM chats with our employee, with our, our you know, coworkers are being recorded. We oh just God, have a long-term trend towards easier <laughs> surveillance, easier data storage. And when those things happen, of course, employers are going to jump on it the same way governments right. do. Tough right. to know exactly what it's going to look like, but I think that we're going to see some of these technologies catch on and they're going to become norms in the marketplace. Hmm. All right, Chris Calabria. So, okay. I feel like, <laughs> should we remind people of the level of surveillance? Just take this moment of the level That's of surveillance really that is already happening in the workplace. <laughs> like Kai's reaction right. to the IM thing seems valuable to note. Like the workplace <laughs> is already a place where people are surveilled yeah. way more than they may even realize, right? Right. That's what sort of enables this framework for them right. to just like turn on more. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, okay. that's the, that's the truth. We're, we're looking at um, a lot of surveillance by a lot of different entities right now. Um, I mean, your cell phone is a portable tracking device. So I think until we figure out the rules around broad surveillance, um, we're going to have a lot more surveillance technologies being deployed. Yeah. Chris Calabrese is Vice President for Policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Chris, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. Don't you feel great now? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Sorry, I have to go. I have to go scrub my entire Slack history. Sorry, 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 sorry. Gotta you should definitely do that. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, no, I, and I, I, we did some research. So we, we actually interviewed um, PwC about the product that they're rolling out and did some research oh, yeah. in advance. Uh, so on, for on those tech, yeah. who are wondering, it's legal. Yeah. Like, yes, companies can do this. And for the most part, you know, barring those kinds of um, uh, worker protections, existing protections that Chris talked about, workers aren't gonna have a lot of choices and they're certainly not gonna have choices if the economy is really bad, the recession's really right. deep and there aren't other jobs to go to. So. Although I know we are not great at planning, maybe we could just plan for this like a little bit. So, so the question really is, how are all y'all feeling about this, right? I mean, what are you thinking about being watched more closely as you go back to work, right? I mean, tell us what it's like uh, if you are being watched, if you're already back at work someplace, and, and tell us what you're worried about. Make me smart um, at marketplace.org. Email, voice memo, we'll take everything, um, and we'll also be right back. All right, we're back. We got news that Molly and I are thinking about, and we're going to share it with you right now. Molly, what do you got? So much news. 
so much know, news. Right? There was so much. I, you probably saw me like flip back and forth. Maybe you didn't, but anybody who was in the dock saw I, me put I in like know. four different things and then take them out and then put in some <laughs> more things and then change my mind. And um, so I decided to go actually with a story that is related to this, which is that, that for years now, as we know, the federal government has been in a back and forth with Apple about encryption, speaking of surveillance. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the, and specifically the Trump administration and attorney general William Barr is very anti encryption and has really been pushing Apple to basically create, you know, some sort of little loophole, right. a little backdoor into encryption so they can get information. So, uh, the most recent battle over this was between the FBI and Apple related to the Pensacola shooting and, yep. um, which was uh, at a naval air station. And so the, uh, the FBI has announced today that, quote, no thanks to Apple, hmm. it was able hmm. to unlock the two iPhones that belong to the Pensacola shooter and find out important information like a connection to Al Qaeda and so on and so forth, which has caused Apple to once again respond and say, great work, FBI. <laughs> we knew you could do it. I'm paraphrasing heavily here. <laughs> yeah. We knew you could do it. We worked with you uh, around the clock to try to, you know, help you in any way that we could that would not involve creating a backdoor that would not only leave iPhones, consumer iPhones open yeah. to anyone, uh, but that would also potentially create security loopholes for the federal government and anybody else who uses these technologies. And so yeah. it's this really interesting thing where they did this big dramatic reveal and it was like, no thanks to Apple. And it was like, yeah, you, yeah, exactly. Yep. Apple's you like, don't need yeah, to break encryption right. to do your job. You just have to like work harder. Right. It was very, right. Uh, yeah. Yep. I think, I, think, I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating. It is fascinating. It's really, really and it's not going anywhere. And, and to be clear, yeah, sorry. It's no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, oh, I mean, I think this is going to continue. I think this encryption conversation is going to continue. But this is sort of like one example of this tension where it seems to make perfect sense that, you know, law enforcement should be able to have like a master key into every phone. Um, but it but it doesn't. It, it doesn't. But, but it doesn't. One master, and, and if it belongs look, to the government, it belongs to everyone. Exactly. And I go back to that thing that you and I talked about when we talked about uh, repeatedly for the past three, whatever it is, years. The slippery slope of letting um, these companies decide what speech ought to be on their platforms, right? It is a slippery slope. Once you yeah. start thinking about in a in a very specific case, surrendering encryption, but not really thinking about what that actually means, you know? Absolutely. And so, it it, yeah. it to me, it just feels completely of a piece with this conversation too, which is like there's the thing that you could do that seems easy. And obvious, yeah. just spy on every employee, just put a backdoor in all the encryption. Just mm -hmm. like, yes, law enforcement would be easy if they had access into everything that we do <laughs> think and right. say. That's right. true, but that's also not the job. It's not supposed to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's my surveillance yep. totally add on agree. for today. Fa fascinating piece. Um, so I went uh, somewhere else, and it's and it's the, the theme that I've brought up a couple of times on this podcast, which is that there are going to be companies and stores and shops that we all know and love that are not going to be here when this pandemic is over. And it turns out, as of today, Pier 1 Imports is going to be one of them. The company uh, filed for bankruptcy protection a number of months ago um, and said today it is selling everything off. It's going to close it down, not coming back. Oh, Can't do it. Really? Yep. Yeah. The, the coronavirus uh, environment uh, has made it – the challenging retail environment, the chief financial officer said, <laughs> has been significantly uh -huh. compounded by the profound impact of COVID-19, hindering our ability to secure a buyer and requiring us to wind down. Look. Wow. There are companies that will yeah. not be here, and Pier 1 Imports, which is not a small company, is one of them. And, and yeah. it, is a, it is a signpost, if you will, of a looming change in uh, – in this specific example, the retail landscape. I mean, it's, it's really funny. My our dishes, the dishes we use every day, they're from Pier One, you know. Oh yeah, or whatever that's worth. Totally. Yeah. Um, I have a question, and I'm not trying to be one of those people who's like, were there underlying conditions? But were there underlying oh, yeah. conditions for Pier One? Because yeah, like with course. Neiman Marcus like, and J. Yes. Crew, it's like you had a bunch of debt because of acquisition. It, right. Do we right. know if that's the case with Pier One? So look, Pier I'm One had gotten whacked beforehand, right? It filed for bankruptcy in February. It was going to close half of its locations anyway. I mean, this was, 
this was a condition that was ex it was an underlying condition, as you said, exacerbated yeah. by the coronavirus. But it's entirely possible that had this coronavirus not happened, it would have been able to restructure, right, which is one provision mm -hmm. of the bankruptcy law, instead of liquidating, which is a different provision. And I just it's it's telling, you know. Yeah, totally. Huh. Yeah. Oh, poor Pier One. They uh, they also say that yep. when they're able to reopen stores, they're going to liquidate all of their stuff. And let me tell you, I will road trip to that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Mm hmm. For sure. Because we need a replacement <laughs> for all those dishes that we've broken over the years. I'm just saying. <laughs> exactly. You know? There is going to be uh, two things before we move on. One, we're actually going to talk what? about retail next Tuesday. With oh, we are. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. And yeah. well, I know, right? Uh, Jody reminded me on the Slack. <laughs> Good job. Oh, okay. Good job, senior <laughs> editor. And uh, and then I, you know, I keep this to a relative minimum, but I just wanted to say happy birthday to Claire, your cousin-in-law, Jay Green, who I used to work with, told me that it's today. Apparently, she's like a big fan. And well, it's her actual birthday. And that like almost never happens. It's usually like, it's your birthday month or whatever. But since Claire and I share a birthday month and today's her actual day. <laughs> birthday month. Happy birthday. I don't subscribe to the I get the whole month part of being a birthday as an adult. But anyway. I mean, uh, due to it actually being March 75th and not May, I kind of almost well, forgot true, that fair. it was my birthday month. So that's I'm just going to have to start now and go through the end of it. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Which is fair something. Enough. All right. Shall we do the mailbag? We shall. Open it up. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. Maybe. We're going to discuss all the things here in the mailbag. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the thing we talked about last week, modern monetary theory with Stephanie Kelton. She is one of the the gurus, if you will, of modern monetary theory, one of the proponents. Um, and she gave us a, a crash, you know, let's call it a crash course, right? It was a 15-minute interview on this huge monetary theory. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> got lots of comments on it, including this one from Pete Salas. Uh, who says, hmm, here's what he says. I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Stephanie Kelton talk about MMT, but she didn't address the practical dangers of making the money supply and therefore inflation a political decision instead of a technical one. Everything works fine in theory when you assume people will act rationally, rationally. but we've already seen what happens when we put short-term, long-term trade-offs in the hands of politicians. Open parentheses, editorial comment here. Oh, yes, we have. Close parentheses. Mm -hmm. They will gradually mm -hmm. accept higher levels of inflation to benefit from increased government spending, just like they accepted higher budget deficits for the same goal. He goes on, this doesn't even account for what could happen when people start doubting official government inflation figures, start questioning the distribution of increased government spending, or if the dollar loses its position as the world's reserve currency. Um, yeah, so look, Pete's not wrong, right? I mean, one of the things that yeah. has to happen for this uh, theory to work, actually, is that... Um, <laughs> politicians need to get themselves out of the economy, which is a flip way of saying, look, there are really serious challenges if this becomes real. That, you know, right. that's just true. Yeah, I think totally that is, true. I think that's actually a really good point. It's not, yep. as with most things, the flaw is not in the theory. Mm -hmm. It's in the humans. <laughs> Dear Brutus, which, yes, for sure. Fair point, yes. Uh, we also sure. asked you to tell us, I, I got, I'm picking up what you're laying down. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, we also <laughs> asked you to tell us about it. it was just a little too on the nose with respect to the fall of the Roman Empire and the whatnot. So I'm just cruising off. <laughs> oh, <man>. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, no, we also bad. asked you yeah. to tell us about what it's like in your state if indeed things are opening back up and more importantly if you're going back to work uh we yeah. got a voice memo from amber bradshaw in dallas texas and here is her perspective hi make me smart team uh my name is amber and i have been back at work at my very large furniture retailer outside of dallas texas for just over a week now mm. it has been a really strange and surreal experience. I'm actually very proud of what my company's doing and providing for staff to keep us safe. Um, they've done all of the acrylic barriers and they've provided staff with mm. face masks, washable ones and disposable ones. But uh, staff aren't wearing them unless it's required and it's only required uh, when we're customer facing. So that's on the sales floor, during opening mm. hours. In the back of the house, they're not required and they're not required before we open. And customers, uh, oh. it's about 50-50. Customers will come in with their 
entire families without face masks on and touch everything they can. And I'm concerned about a resurgence of this virus. Yeah, me too, Amber. Me too. Yeah, no kidding. Me too. I'm concerned anyway, even without all of that stuff you described in that in that voice memo, because holy cow. Yeah, yeah. We really, yep. I, don't I mean, there are so many ways. I don't either. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think it's just going to um, take time. Sort of like like lots of things that were mandated, like cigarettes That's are bad so. for you, but it took a lot of social yeah. pressure to get people to stop smoking, and I think masks are probably yeah. on that trajectory where at some point it'll just be like shame shame for the people who aren't but <laughs> it's gonna take a long time yeah no <laughs> true uh, and it's a shame okay, another one. that one, it has to come yeah. that way yeah totally 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 all right um this is a comment on a comment we had sharon zimmerman on uh we we read one over one of her emails or her email um about deferred treatment for people with chronic health conditions in this you know coronavirus economy um, we got an email from Matt Marshall. He's a family physician in Atlanta, Georgia. Here's what he says. Trust me, this may not be getting media attention, but it is front and center in almost every discussion about the medical world opening. That said, one of the biggest issues in this decision is the nasty fact that we start shedding the coronavirus in high amounts up to 12 hours before we even feel sick. This means that both healthcare providers and patients could be infecting each other without meaning to. And in your listener's case, with periodontal disease, her periodontist and technicians live in people's mouths where risk of infection is highest. Please keep in mind that many in the medical community are high-risk individuals themselves, so they need to consider their health, the health of their medical staff and families when choosing to see patients. We want to see our patients we worry about, but... Sorry, we want to see our patients. We worry about our patients. But Zoom has been helpful, and thank God this pandemic didn't roll through in 2000, which is a really good point, yeah. right, before any of this telemedicine stuff happened. But, but yeah, look, I, I, you know, medical workers have been heroes and are heroes, but they have, you know, real concerns themselves, and, and I get that. Yeah. No, it's, it is brutal. Um, okay, mm. well, as all – thank you, by the way. Thank you. I, I love – like, I am never not amazed at the – the depth and breadth of the audience on this show and how when we need to mm -hmm. know something, there is an actual expert in our audience who can tell us, <laughs> yes, <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what yeah. is happening and what we're feeling. Because, yeah, that's, no, it's a huge deal. And, and there's been yeah. stories about, you know, on Marketplace, how do you get people back into clinics, yep. but also know when it's wise for them to stay out. It is all yeah. part of our long bear hunt that we're on here. Um, we will end, as always, with the Make Me Smart question. What is something I thought I knew, but I was wrong about? And here is Rebecca Davenport. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Rebecca from Salt Lake City, Utah. Something that I thought I knew, but was later wrong about is actually going to be tweaked, if that's okay, to something that I've forgotten about, but have definitely been reminded of. And that's our capacity as people, as a community, as a nation, to recognize when something is serious, we all have to get together and we have to plug in, try to tune out all the crap that's out there and help each other out. I know for myself, I do tend to work well under pressure, but this has definitely helped me remember what I'm capable of as an individual. There are so many silver linings that will come out of this. The economy uh, is my biggest worry, but We'll get through this because we have to. What's the alternative? Thanks so much for everything that you do. Keep it up. Put a smile on your face. Yes, this is dire. But as long as we're able to move forward and find a way to greater health and greater stability, we'll do this. I love that. Yeah, I'll sign on to that. Yep, I love that. There was yeah. a lady who tweeted us actually and said like, okay, great. We get it. This sucks. Let's uh, let's start talking about solutions. And I was like, I love that lady. She's my people. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yes, there That's is not. a there is a tomorrow. Let's figure out what's going to look like. Okay, ready? Here we go. Tomorrow on this program, it's what do you want to know Wednesday. <laughs> So that's it for the show today, the Tuesday Deep Dive. Sign up for the Marketplace uh, Make Me Smart newsletter at marketplace.org slash newsletters. All kinds of good stuff in there, of course. Comes to your inbox crack of dawn Friday morning, like super early. Middle of the night, I think, is when it drops, but for whatever that's worth. You're already up. Look at this man. What uh, a consummate professional. Tomorrow. <laughs> Unbelievable. World class. Make me smart. No, wait, switch. Your turn. And my turn. My turn. Make me smart is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producer, Ben Hethcote, our video intern, Ethan Parrots, and writer-producer, Erica Phillips. 
Today's program was engineered by Drew Jostad, I hope. Our theme music was composed by Ben Tolliday <laughs> and Daniel Ramirez. I can't see him. The executive director of On Demand is Satara Nieves, the senior vice president and general manager of our operation, who I think has been brilliantly modeling work-family balance in her Zoom meetings, oh Deborah goodness, Clark. Yeah. yeah. Somebody asked me, like, how do you handle, I think internally, for like a survey we're doing, I work from, how do you handle when your kids and dogs are in the Zoom? And I'm like, as honestly as possible. What are you going to do? De Deb does it. What are we going to do, right? Deb's yeah. been awesome. It's awesome. Right. It's just like, yes, there for are sure. kids here. Yep. Yeah, deal. There deal. we go. Deal. <laughs>